but her bees have arrived. <laughs> so uh, she's, she's just uh, plonked them down here to, to get them settled in. And how many beehives did you have a, uh, a, a two or three months ago when you came back from Berlin? You had two I hives? I had two hives. I had one main hive, which was this, and I had made the split, which is the yellow one, over Christmas. Okay. Um, and then over the last few months, I've been a bit um, <laughs> overexcited and splitting hives. Um, so I've actually, except for the end two, which are swarms that I caught from a friend's place, the rest of these hives have been split from this, including one more that I took to a friend. So these little new... A couple of frames and a queen cell. Lovely. So you did have two, and now you've got nine, just <laughs> like that, <laughs> in the in the first few few months of. About that, we're going to ask questions about that. If you got questions, put it in the comments below, and also if you got answers to questions, by all means chime in. Help everybody learn. That's what it's about. different opinions. <laughs> we'll probably disagree on a few things no doubt. So um, let's get into it. First of all we're going to take a, a, a look at um, some of they're drawing nicely on those comb guides and then we're going to do um, uh, take the brood box off and get into this the brood box here super. take the super off sorry and get into the brood box and talk about things you might do to manage the size of the colony during spring there's a few things you can do there so questions in the comment below and let's get into it be interesting because I haven't so this swarm was caught a few weeks ago and so they've maybe two weeks ago and they've actually started um, before I moved them here I checked them and they're, they're drawing comb in fact this week's queen spotting was the queen from that from that hive whereas this hive is only uh, I'd say a week or less since we caught it um, and really need to check if they're drawing straight that's a really important time to make sure because uh, the swarm will build new comb really quickly because they gorge on honey before they take off. And so you can get a lot of cross comb if you don't kind of check. I find that I like comb when it's just new rather than waiting till it's all drawn out and full of brood and it's... <laughs> uh, absolutely, and we probably need to level up these hives a little bit as well. I know. <laughs> so um. they just got pumped here late at night, about two nights ago. So. Um, yeah, I need to do a bit of leveling because the, the left and right level of a hive is really important for them to draw straight comb um, because they hang in a festoon. The bees all grab arm and leg together. In fact, we'll see a bit of that today. Um, and so when they hang, if they're hanging on an angle, then of course they're not, they're not going to draw straight comb. So a few puffs of Nice cool smoke, so you don't burn your bees. Hey. And, uh, Might put the veil on. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> so as usual, near the beekeeping, do protect yourself, wear your gloves and your bee suit. Oops, sorry about the noise. And making sure that is sealed. I don't wear gloves because they're my bees and I know them. I'm also quite comfortable. I don't mind if I get stung on my hands. Um, but definitely if you're new to beekeeping, it's really important to feel calm and safe. So I, I would, for the first year, I really wore full protection and gloves. So I felt like calm, I guess. 
Should we look at this one first? Okay, so this is the brand new swarm. I notice you've taped up that. Was that just because of the move? You wanted to make sure they were all taped up or, or we didn't have the plug? Yeah, I didn't have the plug. So I just used a bit of tape on both sides so it's not sticky. Um, and then I had taped up this and this is just because we literally, they were on a fence and we dumped them in the box and then I shut them up and moved them that night. Okay. So I didn't, have, I haven't actually. Have you looked at them since? No. <laughs> okay, it'll be interesting to see if the frames wandered around a bit inside the hive on the move. Oh, true. So that's true. one. <laughs> we might have a mess. So far. <laughs> I didn't check them when they got here. All right, well, let's take off that tape. Can you grab that bit of tape for me? And then let's hope that they're still here. And that, oh, <laughs> well, that's exactly what Zeta said. Just checking for the queen on the roof, but she's not there. So if you move a swarm straight away, great idea to um, get in there. are nice and in alignment but if they had started drawing here we would have had weird cross comb going on between those frames so I was lucky <laughs> so for those new to beekeeping bees are very specific to to their spacing so the frames are designed at the right spacing so the bees will draw their comb from the center of each bar but hopefully but if if you go and put the frames apart they'll put another piece of comb in between because they, they really want to get that specific spacing. So for that reason, you put them all together um, and, and that way the spacing's right between them. There we go. So you do that. So before we put the lid on, we'll go and put them back. And it's, um, we probably could have a little peek. I'm going to have just a little peek because I Oh no, it's a figure of eight. So, um, it's, ah, she's gone. That was very cool to see though. Amazing how they communicate. It's such a fascinating world to actually learn the language of a bee. And, and a bee from here can actually understand a bee from another country as long as they're the same, same Apis mellifera species. And they can tell such intricate information about where the flowers are, how far away they are, what direction according to the sun, and no doubt a whole lot more that we don't understand. Yeah, it's pretty incredible, isn't it? But the, the, a colony of insects that has a language. It's incredible. All right, so I'm going to have just a little pee. I don't really want to disturb them too much, but I just want to make sure. Let's pull this edge frame. So they were festooning and they fell off. So yeah, they're, they're, they're really just, just starting. This beautiful white piece of comb there. So. Isn't that lovely? It's beautiful. So we're gonna be really gentle with them at this stage. And we've just got that really, but they are right on the bar. Nice in alignment. Good work, Eddie. So. And also let us know if you're hearing the audio okay. We're sharing a, a microphone oh, here. Oh yeah, we are sharing a mic today. So, I don't think I'm gonna go any further. I've seen that first comb is nice and straight. They're barely drawing. I don't really want to disturb them too much at this point. So, so let's have a look at the next one. Yeah, let's have a look at the next one. They're, they're doing okay, even though they are.
section you'll find the comb might drift onto the neighbouring frame then it's a real mess and hard to inspect so you'll have to tidy that up if that happens. So that's the reason for the level in the in the sideways direction and why we put a, um, a level on the, the base of our blow hive to find that level. So a little bit of smoke for this one. Get the smoker going again. No, I just had that on there because they were new to that box and they hadn't properized that roof and I ran out of blow hive roof so I had to use an old one. <laughs> That's okay. It's Any the, type the of beekeeping catching, is good. <laughs> the swarm catching kind of hodgepodge, as we call it. A bit of whatever I had lying around. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Sometimes you catch swarms even in a cardboard box yeah. because it's all you've got at the time. And you're like, oh, how am I going to get some frames? What am I going to do next? And it ends up this kind of saga and getting them into a hive. But at least you got the swarm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we were one. I was one short. So I just centered the ones I had. Great, so good idea not to leave them like that for too long because no, they'll start building. Just gonna shake these bees off. Um, generally, you always move calmly and slowly with bees. Um, but this is the exception to the rule when you wanna get bees off something it's actually less uh, agitating to them to just do one quick um, whack and then they're all off gently with a bee brush they kind of hang on tighter so um great trace just dropped us over a spare frame thanks case <laughs> so but, um can we have a peek before we pop that in we can or are you going to talk about so all of these frames uh just as we supply them with the comb guide and we're just letting the bees draw their natural comb themselves and we'll have a look at how they're going on that. A little bit more work making sure they are straight in the beginning but I find that the fascinating time to look and see what they're doing uh, but less work in that you don't have to put foundation sheets in and go through that wax and, wire them up. and wiring so <laughs> I'm very happy not to do that anymore. <laughs> I'm, it's my favourite now so Stone you can come look at this. If, if we hadn't caught that this was low on frames so So, they're already, they're already putting honey in there. It's uh, <laughs> such a wondrous thing, isn't it? How they can produce that from their wax glands. With the with the mandibles, they're manipulating just a tiny fragment of one. Necessarily perfect hexagons because they'll they'll morph one size cell into another size cell, but somehow they all work together in order to to complete the pattern and make sure they've got what they need, whether that be a whole lot of. Uh, 5.3 millimeter cells or whether some drone cells in there if they want them and so on. Oh, look at that and a little bit of pollen down here and we're trying not to tip the frame it's very delicate that's one thing with the naturally drawn comb or foundationless frames as we call them is don't tip it over when the, when the fresh comb is there or it will just fall straight off. So once they've connected it to the sides all the way down then it's a lot stronger and you can tip it over but right now you do have to be careful yeah and i wouldn't even like there's a special way you can flip to look at the other side of a foundationless comb by um there's that empty frame but you wouldn't even do I that i wouldn't even do that to these so if i had a foundationless frame and i pulled it out and i looked at this side and i wanted to see the other side i'd turn it away from my body rotate it and then look so that I'm not tipping it sideways because it can break but these even at this point it's not wise to tip them upside down even because they're uh, 
I wouldn't worry about too much about that fancy manoeuvre. You can also just turn it around on its axis like this, <laughs> just by leaning it on something. Oh, that's true. That's true. There's plenty of, always plenty of ways to do things in beekeeping. <laughs> um, got a bit of, oh, oh, yep, she's laying in here. Oh, wow, laying queen already, good to see. Maybe you can hold that frame and I can try and get a macro. Oh look, that bee's got a bit of wax in its mouth. Mirrors turned into such a uh, I lost it, but there's eggs down here. Let's see if I can see them on the macro and show you. Okay. Yeah. You see there that little tiny, tiny. The egg in the bottom of the cell. A teeny, tiny little dot just there. How cool is that? Oh, I love the white, fresh swarm wax. So cool. And is the queen on that side? No, she's not. Hmm. I don't see her. Did you see her before? Yeah. No. Oh yeah, I have seen her before. Oh, I see. You, you saw eggs, not a queen before. No, I, I, this week's queen spotting on our Instagram is uh, from this height. Yeah, you can also do this to look at the other side. This is what I often do. <laughs> so any questions oh lots of lots of questions coming in and we've got a great big global flow hive community today and tom mobs is saying to you Maria, he recognizes that box ah <laughs> hey tom <laughs> these, uh, are, these are from tom's hive tom's hive um a few people are having a few freezing problems but i guess they can watch it afterwards i think the audio is doing okay but the freezing's um having a few issues but anyway uh, we are in cedar and mirrors down in their paddock um, look, uh, Kane, he's from the Central Coast, his bees swarmed about three weeks ago. He captured the swarm in his backyard um, and then two days ago both of them swarmed at exactly the same time again. He was wondering A, whether that was normal, but he's also a little bit concerned now that, that the original hive, there's hardly any brood left and he just wondered, should he be concerned about the original hive from where the swarms have come from? Yes, it's quite a, a vulnerable time and it's a great question to ask and it's something that could happen to your hive in spring. If, you're, if your colony is really built up and sometimes you've even taken splits and they still want to swarm and other times you've just missed it and the, the, uh, half the bees have taken off with the old queen. Now, when they do that, they normally have a queen ready to go in the hive. She's just about to emerge from her cell and if, if all going well she'll she'll come out of her cell shortly after the swarm she will then go and and mate she might go on a couple of mating flights depending on the weather that could be a, a week before she's mated and then she will start to lay after that so it may be maybe a couple of weeks before you'll see eggs in your hive and then they'll be back on their feet, the queen will start laying and the colony will start to build up again. So that's what happens most of the time. But you have to monitor in case it doesn't happen, in case the, the new queen for some reason doesn't make it. And in that case, you'll need to give the, the hive the resources to make a new queen or introduce a queen or merge the swarm if you caught it back with the original hive. So there's a few options there, but most of the time they'll get it together to have two hives. And, uh, but the, uh, that original hive will be a bit weak. And if it's, if it's got a super on or multiple supers, you'll have a lot of area there for your bees to look after. And what could happen is the small hive beetle takes hold and takes that opportunity while the colonies leak a week 
to lay their eggs in the frames and then you can get in a real mess with a whole lot of, uh, of, of maggots from the small hive beetles taking over your colony and it can destroy the colony. So the, uh, the, the short answer is make sure your original hive uh, that's low on numbers isn't getting taken over by the small hive beetle. So good time to activate the oil trap in the bottom if you've got the flow hive too or catch the hive beetles however you wish to but just make sure those beetles don't get out of control if you have beetles in your area. Great question. So here you can see this whole section here is bees festooning. They're all holding, like they hold kind of from their feet to the elbow of the bee above them and they make this little bee scaffolding. And that's kind of how they, they make their perfect uh, honeycomb sizing. I, I'd love to see if it, it's different, you know, for the drone or the worker, whether they hold in a different spot for the cell size. Hmm. It's so fascinating. I could spend all day just watching them. But we didn't see the queen. I think we missed her on that. Um, oh. But we saw eggs, so we don't need to find her. Okay, so you don't always need to find the queen. It's fun to and it's good to train yourself up, but you're just looking for the presence of the queen, which is eggs or young larvae. And that way, you know, your colony's got what they need to keep going and lay all of those eggs and really build up the population. And go and get those, those flowers, go and get the nectar and pollen, bring that back into your hive and they can build from there. I'm grabbing that. <laughs> okay. Smoked Getting smoked out by the smoker. Um, so I'm adding this extra frame so that we have the complete eight frames in the box. Um, oh, it's a bit wobbly. <laughs> and then I'm going to move these over. So what's nice about an eight frame box is that you have a little bit of extra space on the edge. And what's best to do is to center that. So all your frames are touching and together and in the center. So you've got even space either side. It often means that they draw that edge comb a little bit fatter, but often that's honey and so you get a nice fat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so two swarms are underway. They're, they're, both, uh, they're both building comb, looking good. This one's got a laying queen. Yeah. Um, not sure about the other one. You'll need to check back on that one. Yeah. But yeah probably wait a, a week I might level it today and then maybe wait another week to check in on them great any more questions fantastic um, about the swarm again Jennifer's asking if you do get a swarm and they do they survive without any food or do you have to feed them uh, generally bees are swarming when there's an abundance of nectar that's one of the triggers is there's abundance of nectar which gets the queen laying a lot and then the population in preparation for for the foraging bees to go out and collect all of that nectar. So generally it's not a time you'd need to feed them. Stopped and you noticed all your bees were going hungry then you could feed them but it would be pretty unusual to need to feed a swarm. Getting a lot of those swarming questions, um, a couple coming in, Peter's wondering, is it scary the first time catching a swarm because he's a bit nervous about it and Tanya's then wondering what would you need to prepare to catch a swarm? Okay, a couple of great questions there. Um, so is it scary? Um, now I can't even remember my first swarm catch <laughs> um, a long time ago now but um, I think for some people it would be scary others it would be exhilarating and uh, I'd say it's more completely fascinating and probably quite overwhelming for for the first time because lots of videos so if you, if you want to really get a feel for it watch our live swarm catches watch our videos we actually um, did a live swarm catch just a couple of weeks back you can see that one but we've got heaps over the past five years where we've been catching swarms and that'll give you a good feel of what you need to do. And the next question was? Um, what do you need to do to get prepared to catch so, a swarm? So it's a great idea come the springtime, which is swarm season, 
to make sure you have uh, the ability to catch a swarm if one lands. So that's some frames already ready to go. So something like this. So you need, if, if um, you either need a, a brood box base and lid, and the base and lid can be just made out of, uh, out of anything simple if you don't have it, have the, um, the full flow hive kit. But you need a, a single brood box, some kind of base, some kind of lid, and the frames to match. Now that's the best idea because some swarms are quite big. However, if you're catching a small swarm, you could get away with a uh, that holds just five frames. So that's a smaller box, a nice little one to have in your back of your car with a few frames in it, with your bee veil uh, or bee jacket. And uh, that way, I'll just open this up and show you what it looks like. Um, there we go. So inside there, is just some space for some frames. It's just a mini little starter box. And that um, is a nice little swarm catching setup as well. You wanna make sure you have enough frames to fill it. So you can shake a swarm in there, put the frames in, look after them, and they'll grow from there. Fantastic. Mira, just, you know that second swarm box that you opened and it had the, um, the comb on it? How, um, Kelly's wondering, how long did that take to build up that much comb? Um, that much comb, so I can actually look. When did I catch that swarm? <laughs> Tom might remember. <laughs> Tom's still watching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we are. So I've got a photo of us catching that swarm on Sunday. Oh. So. Wow. Three days. Wow, I thought it was a week ago, yeah. Time flies when you're beekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so just yeah, that that first swarm box is just a few days old, and so they're just wow. It's amazing. They really do draw quite quickly because they have all those honey stores that they've um, collected before they've taken off on their swarm. Isn't it? The colony goes, okay, we're going to swarm. We're going we're going to kick out the queen, and somehow they. De decide who's going and who's staying. Maybe they draw short straws or something. <laughs> and, uh, and off they go, they kick out the queen, but before they go, they, they fill their honey stomachs with honey from the hive. And that way they're resourced so that when they find an appropriate home, they can start building wax straight away. And it's amazing how quick they can build them. Sometimes you shake a, a swarm into a box and within a couple of days, of entirely how, how did they do that yeah yeah if they're a really big strong colony so next let's have a look at this hive and first of all let's start with some observations from the So you could possibly even take another split, not sure. We might for uh, different spring management practices in terms of uh, alleviating congestion in the hive and also what to do, if anything, about queen cells in the brood box. Coming to the back of the hive here, just to, it's another point of observation. You can see We've got some nice light honey coming in. That was that Takaru honey that we harvested a little bit on camera. And it's actually the tree that's right above us here. Those flowers are long gone and the seeds have now set. And uh, there's, there's um, that's it, the, the Takaru tree over here. So that's that beautiful light honey teeth together. It's like it's like their kid's dream lolly shop. It it's, is. <laughs> so it's like really, I say chewy. It's very, it's chewy, it's yeah. very viscous. It must have a low um, water content. So this frame I harvested a couple of days ago and they're already starting to fill, fill it again. So that's also another um, good sign that there's a good nectar flow happening. And I believe this other side window is, I think, half capped. 
Oh, we're getting close. Okay, so they're just capping. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to be able to look into the windows and see what your colony's doing, see the bee numbers, watch them fill all those cells with nectar and finally start closing in the capping. And when they do that, they're saying that the moisture content's nice and low, usually down around the 18% mark, and they're capping it off. It's like putting the preserving lid on a preserving jar to say, that's good to keep on the shelf and they're storing that for some time later that they might need it. Now, lucky for us, they store way more than they need in a typical season and we can share some too. So it's a, it's a beautiful relationship, humans and bees. Okay, All right. we might take that box off and put it uh, on the ground over here. So I've just put something on the ground. So, so it's a good idea not to plonk the box just flat on the ground. You might uh, actually squash a few bees, but if I lean it up against something, there'll be a little bit of space under the hive. So first of all, we're going to take There we go, the roof's up, and I'm going to leave this cover off because this is a wonderful handle. Some beekeepers miss that. They're like, where's the handle, where's the handle? This is a nice, generous handle as soon as you've removed the covers. And same for the sides of the box. So there's a bit of a, a tip there if you haven't worked that one out. And we've got a handle on this end. So you get a handle all four sides on the um, super box, which is the, the heavy the heavy box. Well, I'm going to let you lift that, brother. <laughs> yeah, so... Are you going to... Oh, we could just leave, we could just leave <laughs> that on. Bit of a question of is the excluder going to stick to the super or is it going to stick to the brood box? I'm going to guess it's going to stick to the super this time, so I'll go underneath the excluder. Under the excluder. Oh, no. That way it can just pop. Uh, oh no, it's the other way around. No, it's the other way around. Also, it's nice to be able to check the excluder for the queen. I think it's nice to keep it on the brood. I can just. So there it is there, oh, it's just coming right up oh. and bees get really grumpy when, when the frames lift with the excluder, which I'm not sure that they are. Okay now, if I move this sideways, yeah. it'll come off now. So brace yourself, get someone to help you if it's too heavy for you and yeah, then Put it down. Really. This hive is by nature, likes to propolize and glue everything up a lot. And so yeah, you can see they really had fixed that quite strongly onto the brood frames as well as the super. So as we peel the excluder off, we're just going to do it carefully and look for a queen on the underside. Seeing lots of drones, these big teddy bear bees. <laughs> And you can tell the difference between queens and drones. Often people get confused in the beginning, but they're, they're much rounder in shape. They're like a big teddy bear. The queen has a, a pointy bottom and the drone has a, a blunt one. And their eyes are big and touch in the middle. There's one there. So their eyes are really big and touch in the middle. I'm not seeing a queen. Nevertheless, in case I've missed her, I'll just lean this up against the entrance so the queen can walk back into her hive. Now, it's said that the queen can't fly when she... <laughs> ...and chase her around the hive to reduce her weight in order to fly when they're about to swarm. But just a few days ago, I was inspecting a colony here and they had a laying queen, they had capped brood and brood of all stages and she was running and I was filming her and she ran around and then I stopped filming and she ran up onto the top of the frame and just took off and flew into the sky. Uh, I was just like, um, <laughs> <laughs> come back! 
So, so bees will not always follow the rule book. I don't I know like why. They always, <laughs> yeah, it's always. I feel like we're always learning something new about the bees. When I, you know, expect them to do a certain thing, they they go and do something crazy like that. And um, I'm hoping she was going to come back, but I haven't seen her come back yet. So, so, so Mira's going to have a good look at this hive and see what she can notice as we go. Meanwhile, if there's any more questions. into your brood box. Build all the frames. So if, if there's only a couple of frames drawn in your nuke box and the rest are, are pretty empty, then it's not time yet to transfer them. Wait till the bees have filled that space, they've drawn all the comb in all of those frames, and then it's a good time to transfer them to your brood box, which is this bottom box of your beehive. And, and is any time of the day preferable? So the time of the day is mid-morning to mid-afternoon on a warm sunny day is ideal. Get that, we have busy lives. You might get a month of, of rainy days and you might just have to choose the best time within box now. You do have to be careful if you're in a cold time, if you're in a cold climate, you don't want to chill the, the brood before they're in their cocoon phase. So they're susceptible to, to being chilled, which could kill the brood if they are uh, in their larvae stage before they're cocooning. So you don't want to um, take them apart on a really cold day. And if you do, just make sure you aren't leaving the frames out in the cold. And, and once you've done that seed and you've put them into your food box, how often would you check it? So that depends a little bit on how fast they're moving, but if you're using foundation frames, you could set and forget for, for um, for even a, you know, a month or, or even two, depending on what was going on. Um, and also depending on the requirements in your area. Some people uh, are living in, in places where they need to be monitoring those varroa mites and so on, um, in which case you might need to check them more often. But here, if your foundation sheets, uh, wax foundation or plastic foundation, in your brood box, you could put them in there and uh, leave that nuke to grow and and they would they would be fine like that if you're using foundationless frames like these ones you just want to get in there a bit more regularly make sure they're building straight and once they start building straight they're generally fine from there it's just as they get started you don't want them to be going sideways or they'll follow suit for the rest of the box you can see here this is a beautiful uh, example of a, a foundationless frame where they've drawn their comb and now they've got their brood in it. So straight away we know we've got a, a healthy colony of the laying queen here because we're seeing that brood all over this frame. And there's a few different types of, um, of brood you can see. We've got the ones that are sticking right out here. They're the males, they're the drones as we were talking about earlier. And there's one that's just emerged from its cell. You can tell by it, the way it's white and it's kind of a bit a bit doughy as it's moving around and so fuzzy. fuzzy and waking up in the hive and there's a drone that's more mature the, the golden one so you've got two drones actually here and here who have just emerged and one here that's um, that could be could be even a few months old and they have the larger cells that are a bit bullet shaped that stick out just here like this and then the cells that are uh, flush with the comb but they don't look like honey, they've, they've got a less see-through capping, they're the worker larvae. So that's the worker brood and they're in their cocoon phase. So we'll see a lot of bees emerging from this hive. Yeah, there's lots of fuzzy drones on this side too. Lots of drones.
If you missed that, that was the manoeuvre she was talking about earlier. The <laughs> special manoeuvre of flipping the frame. <laughs> okay, and down the cells you see grubs. Perhaps I should hold it and you can take some More frames. Some, yeah, I realised I forgot to bring my... Um Rest. Oh, do you have them in the cast stone? Do you have the uh, the oh, shelf, shelf brackets? brackets? I do. They're just in the box of jars. In the box of jars. Okay, coming right up. A handy tip Thanks, there. Grace. If, <laughs> if you have those shelf brackets, they double as a nice frame, frame rest bracket. on your hive, which is exceedingly helpful at times like this, where you want to put a frame aside and lift up another one. Yeah, and I always like to have one that allows that first frame, you're always really careful getting that out. You don't want to roll the bees. And so it's great to just, once you have one frame out, to place that aside so you can continue working with a bit more space. Um, and yep, this is definitely brewed as well. I can tell because if it was honey, it would be really full and heavy. I mean, so. I think this is <laughs> yeah. got a little bit of work. A new patch of eggs in here. So I'll keep an eye out for Miss Queenie. I don't know if you can see that. In the bottom of those cells is a bunch of new eggs. So I will kind of glancing along the bottom of the frame as well just to make sure there's no queen cups or queen cells being made if the bees were starting to to think about swarming. Yes, so I feel comfortable. testing out its wings for the first time you can see by the way it's sort of white and fuzzy and a bit curious <laughs> and uh, it could have been its first flight to fly up and land on me it's going wow this is a funny world <laughs> <laughs> like what's this big pink thing okay all right so i'm just using my smoke to clear a bit of the bees off the ends of the frames just so i can work without squashing bees and going sideways to break the propolis. Whoa, this one's really glued up. And this is the frame rest we're talking about. You just take out a screw a little ways and they click right on just as they do for your harvesting shelf. So a nice double use there. And the frame will just sit like that. And you, you, can, uh, you can fit a few frames on there if you need to or you can just put one as you like. Wow, so this frame has tons of bee bread in it. A pollen of all different colors right in the middle there. Let me get that in the light so you can see, yeah. So we can see white and orange and yellow. That's so beautiful. You wanna grab a macro of it? Sure do. <laughs> <laughs> you hold the frame. <laughs> Yeah, see, this is the fun part. It's just behind you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't remember where I put my camera. It's a bit of a boys club on this side. Of the camera. That's them wanting to share their genetic material um, around. I'm going to need to just change the cameras. The, the drones, they will take off and go to a drone congregation area. And that's typically a spot like this. They like a bit of a, a, a the lower down in the valley, a nice clear open area. And drones will hang out 
um, waiting for a virgin queen to fly past. Bees in the way. Watch out, beesies. Get some pollen. Oh, look, there's some bright orange pollen. And some yellow. And some white just next to it. A big drone just walked in the way. <laughs> Excuse me, drone. What else have we got there? This side. Really? Oh, there's the queen. Okay. She's right there. Here we go. We better have a look at the queen. Look. She's her dots worn off. She had a blue dot. So many queen breeders will mark their queens, and the colour will sig signify the year. So that way you can tell if your queen's been in your hive for a number of years. She's running down. It's coming your side, see? It's just there. Where my finger is. Okay, yep. Got her? Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, Queenie. She's just hanging out on the bottom. She's cruising. Not moving too quick. And she's coming back to you, same location. <laughs> there she is. She's crawling along the bottom of the frame. She's a bit like uh, camera shy. She's back on yours. Okay, yep, there she is. <laughs> Just above my thumb there. You can see that the blue dot that's worn right off her thorax there. Beautiful. <laughs> She's just super chill. Yeah, often they move around a little bit quicker with a bit yeah. more purpose and a bit of a striding motion, but perhaps it's been a big day already. <laughs> I mean, laying a few thousand eggs a day is no easy task. So, <laughs> She's like, oh, perhaps it's time rest. for a, for a little break. Rest. She looks nice and nice and big, so big and healthy. That's what you want with a queen, and you know well. Yeah, you can see that. She's, she's built for work. So she doesn't do any foraging at all. The worker bees do that, and they actually feed her. So the queen doesn't feed herself. She gets fed by the worker bees. Yeah, you can see the little attendants chasing her around with their antennae, touching her. And True. Yeah. They're the ones that feed her and groom her and... That's her entourage. Her entourage. Oh, hello bees. <laughs> Lots of people loving the, the lenses you're using, Murray. They're all asking, what are you using? What are you <laughs> using? So, I have two lens setups. This one is um, called a Moment Macro Lens. And so it's a little lens that clips onto the case that comes from Moment. Um, and this is my favourite macro lens I think but it's a little little more bulky and so I use it more for when I'm definitely shooting but um, I also have a second lens that uh, is from a brand called Stylus and it's a again that has a case that attaches but it attaches by magnet and you flip out a little macro lens and so that produces a macro shot as well um, and it's a little I'd say it's a little more handy because I can have it on my phone all the time. As you saw, I just pulled that out of my pocket. I just keep that on my phone all the time and it still fits in my jeans pocket. Uh, but the, the, yeah, the prime lens is a little better quality and I also have some other moment lenses in my kit, some wide angles and 
yeah, I kind of spend my days chasing bees with iPhones. Yeah, so it's an <laughs> iPhone, but they have attachments for other, other camera phones as well. Um, cool. Okay. Beautiful. So, so much of the um, amazing macro bees and slow motion bees is courtesy of Mira and her amazing obsession to chase bees around the world. So, <laughs> the queen still, she's just here and she's still just chilling. I haven't seen her lay. Yeah. It'd be nice to, to catch her laying. She'll actually dip her abdomen right down to the bottom of a cell and drop an egg at the bottom. And the other day you even saw there was an egg uh, <laughs> right at the tip of her, her abdomen there. In one of the hives at work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I got a macro shot of, of the queen sort of running along the frame with a little egg hanging out. Oops, <laughs> couldn't wait, couldn't wait. <laughs> she was actually a queen that was laying um, multiple eggs in cells, so something, uh, wasn't, uh, something yes. wasn't quite right with that colony. Sometimes you get that uh, a queen who lays multiple eggs when she's just getting used to it. She's getting a little bit trigger happy. Yeah, when she's young and freshly mated, sometimes she can take a bit of time to get used to it. But this one was actually a, an older colony. I think we ended up replacing that queen eventually in that hive. She never seemed to sort it out. I'm just going to clear that so you can pop her back in. Okay, queen. Queenie back in. <laughs> queen is back in the hive. Okay, we've got time for a few more questions and we're going to have a bit of a discussion as well about the different types of spring management that beekeepers do. And there's no wrong or right way to do it. There's just different ideas and in the end you can do what suits you. So some people like to take a split and that's my favorite and we Mira might even decide to do that with this hive. So uh, letting them build up to the point where they may swarm, you get in there and take a split and that way you've got a good chance of getting another colony going without half of the bees swarming off because you may or may not catch that swarm. And if you're in a suburban area, then some people might be fascinated by a swarm on their washing line and others may not. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit luck of the draw in your neighborhood there. Um, so good idea to get in there and do your spring management, which I like to take a split. So, uh, so order your equipment, order another hive and get in there and take out some of the frames. If you missed our Facebook Live of taking a split, we actually did it on this hive when it was in another location. You can dial back a few videos and watch that. We also have the beekeeper.org, which is a very detailed handhold with experts from all around the world. Uh, showing you how to do all sorts of things beekeeping in a nice sequential order aim to take you from knowing nothing right through to having a, a deep and even scientific knowledge of bees so have a look out for that it's free to try if you're interested the beekeeper.org uh, but otherwise we've got plenty of videos on our Facebook feed live videos showing you how to do a split etc Another thing you might like to do if you don't want to take a split is you might decide to limit their swarm tendencies by reducing the congestion in the hive. And that can be done by a harvesting, making sure there's plenty of space for them to store honey in spring. But the primary thing is actually uh, enough room to keep laying. So, so the primary trigger for swarming is there's not enough space to lay in the hive anymore and to alleviate that what you can do is take out a, a, a that have honey typically on the edges of your hive you'll get some honey and replace them with uh, with a new one like that but instead of putting them on the edge you'd put them say here and here and open up that brood nest, give fresh new space, and that will limit that trigger of, of congestion. So that's a typical thing to do. Get in there, take a couple of honey frames out. You can then eat that comb and enjoy that, and put the uh, brood frames here and
brood, then you can actually place it sideways under the lid like that, prop it up for a few days, allow that brood to hatch and then you can take it away. One thing with naturally drawn comb, it's a bit uh, easier I find than the old wax and wiring where you had to take that frame away, rebuild it with wax and wire foundation and then uh, put it back in so you'd normally get one prepared and you'd do a swap. Whereas right here right now we can simply just lift up a frame, get your hive tool, cut out all it into a, something like a baking tray and then the frame can just go straight back in so there's no need to have that um, workshop phase of the cut out the honeycomb if there was no brood in there and put it straight back in and move those frames right to probably position three here and maybe um, six here and you would then have that uh, fresh new space for the queen to lay. So I want to make a split. <laughs> okay, so but I think I just want to make a three a three frame split, not a not an even. I've lost the queen again. <laughs> no, but yeah, <laughs> I know that she's back there, back so there, I, okay. I can take these if I want. Okay, so this is the second frame that I've pulled that I've found lots of capped brood and nice big patches, actually the third frame of lots of pollen. Yep. Um, and so lots of pollen and bee bread. Basically, if I want them to raise their, a new queen, so I'm making a split, say with three frames into a little nuke box, and then I want them to raise a new queen, I want to make sure they have all the resources they need. So this comb doesn't have any eggs in it so i need to find another frame that has eggs so they can raise a queen but they do need to have lots of pollen and bee bread because they need to create royal jelly and that's the nurse bees that create the royal jelly using the pollen um so oh oh she's offloading pollen see to hold the frame <laughs> Don't you okay. love brothers and sisters? <laughs> the, the bee spy has found another interesting thing going on this in the hive. Right here, she has just started offloading pollen. You can see there, I don't know if you can see. She backed, no, no sorry. She backed into the cell. What if I go around this way a little bit? Nope. Uh, no, I think it's too hard to see. If you tilt it just slightly up, please. Yep. I'll have to just show you. So she right now, I can see that she's rubbing off her pollen baskets in the cell there, which is hard to see from on top. She stuck her head down the cell and she had white pollen on her legs. And then she uses the little spur. You can see stone if you come around behind me. She uses the little spur on her middle legs to knock the pollen off. And then you can see there's freshly offloaded pollen in that cell. Look at that, a live example of the way they collect their pollen then... Offload it, see that fresh little bowl of white pollen in there? There it is, the white glistening in the bottom of the cell and now it's a process of and that was her just running off adding their special sauce the, their enzymes their uh, a little bit of a bit of honey topping and away it goes to a beautiful sourdough which partly digests those pollen grains and makes their bee bread which is then what the uh, is used to feed the young larvae now if they were going to uh, um, raise a queen, they would actually just feed royal jelly and no bee bread to the young larvae. And that, uh, through epigenetics, the bee turn into a queen. It's actually the presence of of uh, the plant proteins which switch off those genetics and turn it into a worker bee. So as soon as the um, three-day-old larvae is fed the bee bread, 
she becomes a worker bee. It's um, quite amazing. So Mirrors is going to take a split, but before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about some other options of spring management. So another thing that some beekeepers do is they get in there and they look for queen cells and they knock them off. Um, or they could take them away and use them to, to, to make splits. Um, so we're not seeing... going to raise a queen or queens and swarm. So some beekeepers prefer to get in there and just slice them off with their hive tool so that they can keep their original queen and the hive then won't swarm. So that's another technique I don't don't There it is there. So some people will cut the queen cells off and actually graft them by just squishing this wax into another frame in another hive and that queen could then emerge from there. Uh, and others would just cut them off and, um, and just not use them to limit the hive swarming. If you, it's, it's sort of more advanced. I wouldn't recommend you do that because you might not notice that the bees are raising a queen because they they yeah. don't have one yeah. and in which case you could get into more trouble with a queenless hive so if you're not sure just let the bees do it themselves they usually know what they're doing so Mira's taking a few frames out of here and put but I want to because I'm trying to grow colonies because I have some friends that need bees. <laughs> um, I don't, I'm focusing more on that than I am on, on making honey at the moment. Um, and so I can see by how many frames of brood we've pulled out, the mixture of all brood sizes, the fact that we have a laying queen, that this colony is strong enough. I mean, look at the bees. There, there's lots of bees in here. Lots of bees and half of them are over there in the super exactly. windows and uh, so there's plenty of bees and there's plenty of brood. In fact, they've got brood all the way out to the edges, which shows that they're going to, going to rebound really quickly. Even taking a few frames out won't slow them down much. So, got capped worker and drone and... Has she laid in here? Oh, some nectar's dripping. Not even close to being honey yet. It can just drip right out of the frame. Tip it over. There's actually, can I hand you that? There's a worker bee hatching. Okay, hatching worker bee. Here we go. <laughs> this is what it's like beekeeping with a robot. Yeah. <laughs> Hang yeah. on, got to get a macro. <laughs> it could take a while. We might forget what we were doing. Yeah, we could sorry. spend all day chasing a bee around a hive. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we could. So, let's see. out <laughs> yeah why not okay <laughs> the 
a sting out is scrape sideways you don't want to squash more venom in if i just get a hive tool like this uh i can just oh she just popped out there's she's we just missed it but in the center there's a